Hello, good morning. Today's scripture is found in Romans 8, 28. And we know God causes everything to work for the glory for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor, from our newest freshman at Thunder Bird Academy. So, <laughs> and to our other graduates, we... Uh, by the way, you know, I think uh, the Bible tells us that God would rather hear children sing than all the professional pontificating that we can do. How about that? <laughs> um, so thank you, young people, for, uh, for your leading us in, in uh, worship. And thank you, Jackie. I wasn't out here to hear your beautiful song, but I heard it back there. So thank you for that. There is power in the, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Uh, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise and honor that we are capable of. And we just ask that the Holy Spirit draw very near and that you touch us and lead and guide us. And may we hear your voice speaking to us, Lord. We truly depend upon you for everything. And so we thank you for hearing our prayer, for being with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this text in the Bible, uh, Romans 8, 28. Um, maybe we could say it together. Can you read it? It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. How many of you believe that? How many of you know it? <laughs> oh, not so many hands this time. How many of you know that text is true? That's kind of a tough text uh, sometimes to know something in the world that we live in today, to know anything, to know it without a shadow of a doubt, to be convinced of it, to be convicted of it, to, to know that it's truth. Uh, that's kind of difficult in the world that we live in today, isn't it? Um, the last couple of days, Dee Dee and I have been shopping for a used car. We want to get a, you know, a something, uh, 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 three or four thousand dollar convertible, so we can tool around on the on the island, you know. And uh, dealing with uh, the folks that we've had to deal with, it's been interesting because you can't trust anything they say. Um, they say they have a car. We show up. It's not there. Oh, we just sold that, but we've got this one over here for three times the price. No. So to know something, to know something is true, to, to, uh, to know within your deepest soul of souls that something is true is uh, difficult. Um, what is truth? That's a question that Pilate asked uh, Jesus in John chapter 18. You remember the story when Jesus had been brought before Pilate uh, by, the, by the Pharisees and... Uh, Pilate was questioning him, and he asked him, are you a king? And Jesus said, yes. And this is kind of the interchange that went on between them. Um, Pilate said, you are a king then. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth hears my voice or listens to me. One, one version says, listens to me. And Pilate's response is very interesting. He says, what is truth? You say everybody that hears the truth hears you, but what is truth? Um, it's a very kind of a cynical and sarcastic response, isn't it? What is truth? In other words, in Pilate's world, world there was not really such a thing as truth. Because, see, Pilate was a politician, <laughs> and politicians lie for a living. They, they lie to get votes. Yeah. How do you know a politician is lying? Because his lips are moving, right? <laughs> How cynical of me to say, say that. But, but it's the truth. And that I know. <laughs> but politicians live in a world of untruths, partial truths, half-truths. 
uh, tell the people what they hear, anything, you know, manage the story, spin the story, massage the story. Uh, how do you, yeah, um, that's the world that Pilate lived in. You think human nature has changed since Pilate's time? It has not. Um, the truth was fluid, ethereal. There was no such, in, no such thing in Pilate's mind as absolute truth. Uh, in his world, you had to be cynical and untrusting in order to survive. To believe somebody was to make yourself vulnerable and put yourself at risk. And so therefore, Pilate could not do that. And so when Jesus came and said, yeah, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yeah, the Spirit will guide us into all truth. Jesus spoke truth. He was truth. He was truth incarnate. But Pilate didn't recognize the truth standing before him. And why not? Um, we get an explanation of that in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verse 14, which says, this, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So in other words, unless the Holy Spirit guides you into all truth, you're going to continue floundering in a world of lies. So how do we know something to be true? Uh, it's usually by experience, right? How many of you have experienced as a teenager, you experienced true love? True love, come on. What's greater than teenage true love? Well, uh, Chipotle burrito, for one. <laughs> I really love those Chipotle burritos. Yeah, true love uh, was painful as a teenager because it wasn't true. We just thought it was. Um, but over 35 years of being in love, I think I have a little better understanding of what love is at this time, at this point. John, the, the beloved disciple, uh, often spoke of love. He spoke of love in many different places in the Bible, but he knew the love of Jesus was real. He knew it. He had experienced it. He knew that when Jesus said he loved them, he was telling the truth. Uh, John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have uh, touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That's Jesus. This life appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. John experienced truth. He walked and talked with truth. He, he saw truth perform miracles and raise the dead and heal the sick and so forth. And so John was able to say, we proclaim to you that which we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. You know, my problem is, is my ears wiggle when I talk. And uh, so this thing keeps flopping around. Well, that was a long introduction to our text today. Uh, for we know, we know that all things work together for the good. We know it because it's the truth. Because God said it, and God always tells us the truth. Do you know? What do you know this morning? Um, as I was studying this, I, I, uh, I, I did a week of prayer for TCE uh, the week before school was out, and we talked about Joseph and all the things that Joseph experienced. Joseph was born into a troubled family, to say the least. Uh, his mother died young. He was raised uh, by, uh, you know, a, with a lot of uh, stepbrothers and sisters. Um, you know, some of his stepbrothers uh, didn't like him. So they tried to murder him. How many of you have had a stepbrother or a sister try to murder you? <laughs> Yeah, we can't, sometimes we can't even get along with our own brothers and sisters. Uh, um, so they tried to murder him. They sold him into slavery. He, he, he was wrongly accused. While in slavery, he was imprisoned. And finally, after all of that, after all of everything that he'd gone through, he was uh, brought out and became second in command in the, in the nation of, of, of Egypt. There's a text in, in uh, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, that is the Old Testament version of Romans 8, 28. Because when Joseph's father died, when Jacob died, 
his brothers, his stepbrothers, the ones that had been so cruel, so, so uh, 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 unjust to Joseph, they just knew that at this point, now that Jacob was dead, that Joseph was going to come after them and, and get revenge for what they had done to him all those years ago. And now Joseph was a supremely powerful man, and they were just shepherds. And so they came to Joseph, and they knelt before him. They said, forgive us, Joseph, forgive us. Do you remember Joseph's response? The Bible says he wept. He fell on their necks and wept. He swept them up into a loving, brotherly embrace and said, you idiots, I love you. I love you. This is how the Bible says it. As far as I'm concerned, Joseph said, God turned into good what you meant for evil. Is that Romans 8, 28? All things work together for good. Bad things. Evil things. Good things. As far as I was concerned, God turned into good what you meant for evil, for he brought me to this high position I have today so that I could save the lives of many people. That's how God does things, brothers and sisters. That's how that text works, if you wondered about it in your life. How can this work out for my good? How can this situation, how can this, this, uh, this turmoil that I find myself in, how can this possibly work out for my good? You know, only God can do that, because only God can take something that, that is evil and turn it into something good. It may take a while, but we know that. To know something is to have evidential belief that it is true. Um, in in George, George Knight's commentary, he was my favorite professor in seminary, and he wrote a wonderful commentary on the book of Romans, and he made these uh, points about this text. Uh, follow along with me. God is active in our lives, for we know that in all things God is working for our good. God is active in your life and in mine. Um, you know what a deist is? A deist is someone that, that believes in God. They believe that God is the creator, but they reject the idea that God wants to be personally involved in, in your life, in my life. They believe that, that God is the great creator, but he walked away and just left things to, their, to, to, to work out however they will. He wound up the clock as it was and, turned and, and walked away. Many of our founding fathers were, were deists. They did not believe that God is an active participant in the personal life. Well, I'm not sure how you can read the New Testament and, and, and come to that conclusion. Uh, when I see the Jesus' words assuring us of the personal love of God for us, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. The Father himself loves you, Jesus said. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And uh, now all these wonderful texts that, that, God, uh, that Jesus assures us of the personal, active love of God, that God is active in our personal life and desires to be more than, and he'll be as active as we'll allow him to. The first words of Jesus after the resurrection, I'm, I'm ascending to my, to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. The assurance that God is going to be active in the life of, of the disciples. God is actively, unceasingly, energetically, and purposely involved in the personal life of each one of his children. We know that. We know that. Second point. We know that when God works in the lives of his children, he works for our good. Sometimes bad things come into us. Sometimes things happen that, that break our hearts and, 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 and make, us, make us wonder, where is God? Why is God allowing this? Why is God letting me do this? But the text says we know. We know he works for our good. For we know that in all things God is working for the good of those. He works for our good. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 is a favorite text of many of you. I know the thoughts that I have for you, saith the Lord. Thoughts to prosper you, not to harm you. To give you hope, to give you a future. Good thoughts. God wants more than anything for you and I to experience eternal salvation. He doesn't really care whether we're comfortable or not. 
Sometimes God will make us uncomfortable in order to help us to, to, to point us in the right direction and help us to bring us to the point where we surrender to Him and He can do what He needs to do in our lives. God's greatest purpose is not your wealth, your temporal blessings, your bank account, your 401k. Thank goodness for that. Mine's been taking a nosedive for the last couple of weeks. God cares about my personal salvation. He wants me to be saved. He wants me to experience abundant life, not only here, but in the future as well. So when that brings us to our third point, when God brings things into my life, be it good, be it bad, it is working for my good. So when God brings these things into my life, whether they're bad things or whether they're good things, His ultimate purpose is my salvation. We know that in all things, not some things, in all things, the good things. When good things come to our life, we praise and we, we thank the Lord and we're grateful. Or we can say, wow, what a great guy am I. Look at how smart I am. Look at the plans that I've made and now it's resulting. So when our attitude is like that, then maybe God says, well, I better bring some bad things in. But sometimes when God brings the bad things, uh, uh, we, we can either reject Him, we can be angry at Him, or we can realize our great need of Him and how desperately we need His help and guidance and direction in our life. And so the bad thing turns us around and, and points us back and gets us back on the road that we should be on. In all things, God is working for our good. All things work together. And only, and only God can do that. Can you imagine trying to put together all the millions of moving parts, the billions, the trillions of moving parts in the universe in order to ensure that you and I have every opportunity for salvation. Only God can do that. The good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, all things. We know that. We know that all things are working together. His love for us is his great motivation. We know that in all things God is working to the, together for the good of those who love him. By the way, why do we love him? What does John say? We love him because he first loved us. We, God puts love in us that enables us to love him. Because we were incapable of, of love response of a love response to him. We love him because we f he first loved us. Our love is in response to his great love. Look at this, this incredible text. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says that while we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. Christ loves his enemies. God loves his enemies. He wouldn't ask us to do anything that he doesn't do himself. So God's motivation is love for us. He does not want us to fear Him. He wants us to love Him. He desires the obedience of love and trust, not fear. And so He pours out love after love after love into our life, hoping to get the response of love back to us. How many of you remember the first time your, your little one said, Mama or Dada? How many of you remember that? Holding that little bundle of, 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 of screaming... Uh, diaper needing changing love and hearing those first words dada or mama and and do you remember what it did to your heart Dee, Dee just found a picture of me with my hair was about like this when I was about 19 years old holding our holding our first little little uh, little Jason and it took me back 35 years ago <laughs> to feel that love that 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 that, uh, that feeling that if anybody tried to, to mess with this kid, I'd tear him from limb to limb. God loves us. Therefore, we can trust his purposes. We can trust his motives. We can trust that what he allows into our life is meaningful to us because he loves us. And finally, uh, by the way, you know, uh, Jesus' last request was to be able to spend eternity with us. Uh, John 17, 24 says, Father, I would that those that you have given me may be with me where I am. That's an amazing request. 
for we know it to be truth. We know it. Uh, Romans, uh, um, I can't read my own writing there. What does that say? Romans, I need my glasses on. Romans 5.15, that's right. Uh, this is a, a, a different version. It's from the message, I think. It says, this doesn't mean, of course, that we only have only a hope of future joys. We can be full of joy here and now, even in our trials and troubles. Taken in the right spirit, these very things will give us patient endurance. This, in turn, will develop a mature character, and a character of this sort produces a steady hope, a hope that will never disappoint us. More already, we have some experience of the love of God flooding through our hearts by the Holy Spirit that he's given to us. Have you experienced God's love? I hope you have. What he wants us for us is face-to-face -face fellowship. So God is active in our life. He works for our good in all things he is working. His love for us enables us to love him and trust him that what he's doing. And finally, his ultimate purpose is our salvation. The Bible says, for we know. So the question this morning is, do you know? Do you know him? Do you believe that? Because if you don't, then you have no clue. You're, you're like, where, where is this coming from? Where is that coming from? Why is this happening? But if you do know it, then that's an anchor. It's a rock that you can stand on when things get, get rough. For we know it. We know it to be truth. I have a... Uh, a uh, quote, this is uh, from the Desire of Ages, um, but it's also from Help from Daily Living on page 19. It says this, it says, too many in planning for a brilliant future make an utter failure. Let God plan for you. How about that? What a novel idea. Let the guy that knows the future make your plans. Sounds good to me. As a little child, trust to the guidance of him who will keep the feet of his saints. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Let God plan for you. And when God plans for you, then you can claim Romans 8.28. You can know it. And you can claim this wonderful text as well. Trust in the Lord. Read it with me, please. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Amen.